This is a video for chapter 5.3 on the classification of biodiversity. With all the species on our planet, considering animals, plants, fungi, all of those different things, um, those organisms that are found in different regions often um, are called different things, okay? So the naming of something using common names can be really confusing because they can vary by region to region and language to language. So when we're identifying and naming species, we often don't use that common name, but we use something called binomial nomenclature. Okay, so nomen referring to name, okay, by referring to two. So it's a system of naming organisms using two names. And um, these names are decided upon every year by, well, not every year, but every four years um, by a group that meets um, called the International Congress of Zoology, probably uh, the most exciting party you could ever imagine, uh, where they decide on the scientific names of organisms. And as much as I like to make fun of that, um, there are some really important reasons why we need those names. Okay, so binomial nomenclature um, allows us to be sure that an organism has a unique name, that it can't be confused with another organism, that when you say that name, you know exactly what organism you're referring to. It also ensures that they are universally understood. So these names are the same in Spanish, they're the same in Mandarin, they're the same in English, okay? So all of them, no matter what culture or language, are going to use that same name. And in all fairness, most of them are Latin-based, which no one understands. So it's equally unfair for everybody. And finally, it um, provides no opportunity for changing the name without a valid reason, okay? So you can't just up and call something uh, a completely different name and expect it to be recognized. So these names are in permanence. Throughout human history, we've done a pretty dang good job of identifying and naming species. But even though we've named millions of species, most of the species out there are yet to be discovered. Okay, so they live in places that are very difficult to access, or they are um, rare, or they blend in, or they look similar to other species, um, or we just haven't found them yet. So when we discover new species, one of the first things we have to do is come up with a name for them. And coming up with a name is a lot harder than you might think. There's a lot of crap that you have to do. So first you have to supply uh, supporting evidence that it isn't already an identified species. Okay, so if you find something that you think is new, you have to prove that it is in fact new and it's not something that's already been identified. That's actually a lot more work uh, than you might think. You have to do a crazy good job of describing the organism in terms of its physical traits, cellular traits, chemical traits, probably a lot of DNA sequencing going on there too uh, in these days. You also have to use it uh, or name it using the rules of binomial nomenclature, which we'll get into in just a moment. And then at that wild party at the International Congress of Zoology, your naming process has to undergo peer review. So naming a new species, uh, really quite a lot of work. Okay, so when we're writing some things uh, name using binomial nomenclature, there's a few rules, okay? So first of all, we're gonna be using two names and those two names come from the genus and species. So we take their full classification, we find the most specific levels, the genus and the species, and we use both of them. So it's kind of like a first name and last name. The genus is going to be capitalized, but the species is not.
So I said we were going to use the genus and species, those two most specific levels of classification. More on that in a moment, but those levels of classification are what we call taxa. That's plural. Taxon would be uh, singular. And these are categories that scientists use to generate names of organisms and to place them into classification groups. Okay, so one of the newer taxa um, that we've been using for the last couple of decades is something called a domain. So a domain is like a large group of organisms, the biggest group you can put something into. Okay, and we have three domains. We have bacteria, and some, sometimes you'll see them written as eubacteria. These are prokaryotes, like our friend E. coli here. Okay, so we also have archaebacteria. They're also prokaryotes, and those are like these thermophiles, these really strange uh, bacteria. A lot of archaebacteria are very special in the fact that they can live in very hot or very salty uh, environments. We call them extremophiles. All right, and then we have all of the eukaryotes. So, of course, they are eukaryotic. And these are our plants, animals, fungi, protists, okay, like this guy. So you're going to notice that viruses aren't on that list. And there's a very good reason, because we call these the three domains of life. And remember, viruses aren't considered a living thing. They have no metabolism. They have no way to reproduce. They make the host cell do that. Okay, they have no way to um, uh, regulate their internal environment, okay? And there's a lot of other problems with putting viruses in there. So we don't consider them living things. We use a different system to classify them, uh, which we're not going to get into here. Okay, so once an organism's domain has been established, okay, we can then um, classify it using... Um, more and more and more narrow classifications, okay? And they go in this order. So the broadest or biggest one is called a kingdom, followed by a phylum, and then class, order, family, genus, and species. Okay, so these are going to be the most broad. Okay, they're going to include the most organisms, like all of the animals are in one kingdom. Okay, and as we go further and further down, they get more and more narrow. Okay, and they include fewer and fewer organisms, all the way until we get down to species, which includes one organism. So some people like to use mnemonics for these. Um, I don't. I just remember them. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Other people like to um, use little plays on words to come up with that. So a mnemonic is going to be something like King Philip came over for good soup. Okay, for kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So I'm hoping that maybe you can come up with one. Um, on your own. And then one of the requirements for IB, um, which is absolutely insane, uh, is that you can completely classify organisms, all of their taxonomic levels, uh, and two examples of your choice. So make sure that you're taking some time out to um, completely fill out the classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, uh, for those two different things. Now, organizing things into those different taxa uh, is great, okay, if you want to really easily identify something and name something, but there are other ways of classifying things too. We could classify them by feeding habits, which we did back in ecology. Are they producers like algae, consumers like the sea turtle, carnivores like an owl or a herbivore um, like a caterpillar? Or we could classify them by habitat. Are they land? which we call terrestrial or aquatic species. And sometimes we can even classify them um, by activity, like nocturnal, active really at night, or diurnal, active during the day. So keep in mind that this uh, way of classifying things is really great, but it again is not the only way. 
So those early naturalists, you know, like people like Darwin and his contemporaries um, that were seeking to classify new organisms had a really rough time because they could only use visible characteristics. Nowadays, we can cheat a little bit because we can analyze their DNA and proteins. Okay, so for DNA, if we're doing analysis there, we are lo looking at those nucleotide base sequences, okay, or letters. And if we're looking at their proteins, we're going to look at their amino acid sequence, okay? And so how that helps us is by um, really determining how much they have in common. So if I look at two species and they have um, a lot in common, that tells us that they have a closer evolutionary relationship, okay? So two organisms that have a fairly recent common ancestor are going to have a lot of similarities. Whereas two organisms that have a more distant common ancestor should have way more differences, okay? So again, we can take a look at those letters or take a look at those amino acid sequences and the more they have in common, the more closely they related they are in their um, phylogeny, okay, or evolutionary history. All right, so this business of putting things into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species is something called the Linnaean system, uh, named after the scientists that developed it. And again, when this was first done, it was based on just observable characteristics. So two organisms might be put into the same genus because they look a lot alike and they have similar behaviors. And remember, those things were used to write their names. But recently, the ability to analyze those DNA sequences or amino acid, uh, amino acid sequences has told us that in a lot of cases, we were really wrong. That two organisms might have looked the same, but from a DNA perspective, they are not very closely related. And so one of the great parts about science is that we are constantly looking to improve our knowledge, improve our methods, and it's okay to admit that you made a mistake that based on the information you had available at the time, you made the best guesses that you could. But now that we have new information, we can reevaluate things. And so what's going on right now is a lot of renaming. Okay, if you ask your grandma what flower this is, she's going to say this is an aster. It's not though. Okay, it actually belongs to an entirely different genus that is relatively unrelated to the asters, and we know that now because of these DNA analyses. So kind of a cool example of how we're going back and um, redefining what we thought uh, were pretty solid relationships. Okay, now when we're classifying things and determining their relationships with other organisms, we're doing what's called natural classification. And this is really um, all about ancestry. So that purple flower that we just looked at isn't in the aster genus anymore because it's descended from a, a different ancestor as DNA has shown us. Okay, so just like all of these classes of vertebrates, okay, um, are descended from a single common ancestor, so are those other relationships that we um, can figure out through natural classification. Artificial classification uses different criteria, like whether they're edible or not, um, to classify things. And in our class, for this, our purposes, we should always be using natural classification because A, uh, it's going to show us how things are related from an evolutionary perspective. It gives a lot more order to things, um, and it also allows us to predict characteristics. So if I say that something belongs to uh, mammals, without even knowing what I'm talking about, you're already going to know some basic information about that organism. So much, much better to use natural classification. Okay, so now that we've kind of mastered classification, let's go on to talk about some of this biodiversity that we're seeing. And I, what I really want to start with is the plant, uh, the different plant phyla. Phyla is just plural for phylum. So if I'm talking about plants, we know that we're in the domain of eukaryotes, and I'm in the plant kingdom, okay? 
all plants share a few things, okay? So everything belonging to the plant kingdom is going to be multicellular. It's going to have cell walls. They're going to have chloroplast. And, of course, they're going to produce things uh, using the energy uh, from the sun. There are lots of phyla in this kingdom, okay? So we have the, all of the plants. And if I look at all the phyla, there's a whole bunch of them. We're only going to take a look at four, and you need to be ready to um, name them, describe them, and identify them. And the first ones are called bryophytes. So we're going to see this P-Y-H-T uh, ending, and these are, of course, our plants. You'll see that later. They are non-vascular. So if you're a vascular surgeon, you're working on someone's uh, blood vessels or arteries and veins. So the arteries and veins of plants are called the xylem and phloem, and they help to transport uh, materials through plants. Well, these guys are non-vascular. They don't have those things, okay? So they have to get all of their water basically through osmosis, and so they're going to be really short and close to the ground, and they're going to have to grow in damp areas, again, because they don't have specialized tissue to deliver that water throughout their plant. So these are our mosses, these guys, and the liverworts. You're going to notice, again, that they're short, um, close to the ground. They grow in bogs and other forests and crazy damp areas, and those are the bryophytes. Okay, philocinophytes um, have um, one of the most unique names. Um, I remember this because F for philocinophyte, F for ferns. So these guys are vascular. They, they have those tissues. Okay, so they can grow a little bit bigger, but they don't have flowers. And that's because they are asexual reproducers. So on the underside of these fern leaves are going to grow little spores, and those spores are going to be exact clones of this parent plant because they are, again, not sexual reproducers. And they have long, thin leaves. You know what ferns look like. Okay, next we're going to get into the conifers, or coniferophyta, if you're fancy. These have vascular tissue, and they also have woody stems, okay? So these are going to be like trees. They have needles instead of leaves. That's an adaptation to prevent water loss. They are wind pollinated, which is why their flowers are really lame. You often don't see flowers on here. Um, so those are all wind pollinated. And they produce seeds enclosed in cones. So these are our pine trees, cedar trees, Christmas trees, okay, are evergreen trees that are producing these cones. So that's how I remember that. Cones and coniferophytes go together. Okay, and our last plant phyla is the one with the biggest name. It's the angiospermophytes. Okay, so angiosperms, okay, I remember this one, unfortunately, like sperms, so it has something to do with sexual reproduction. Okay, so they are vascular, and these are our flower-producing plants, okay? So they are mostly going to be pollinated by insects. There are a few wind-pollinated flowers out there, um, but mostly we're looking at insect pollination, and they produce fruit, okay? Fruit is what develops around the seed after a flower has been pollinated. So anything with flowers on it, so including like herbaceous plants, that's not a carnation, but if it was, uh, that would be a great example. Whatever this is, is also an angiosperm. Uh, and most of our trees, so broadleaf trees like this, uh, produce flowers also. All right, so let's leave those pesky plants in the dust and get down to our animal phyla. So again, if we're talking about animals, we have to be in the domain of eukaryotes, and we're going to be in the animal kingdom. And it just occurred to me that maybe I didn't do such a good job of explaining uh, the different kingdoms. So we talked about the different domains, okay, that bacteria or eubacteria and archaebacteria have just one kingdom each. But in eukaryotes, that's split into plants, which we already talked about, animals, which we're about to talk about, fungi, which we're going to totally ignore, and protists, which we're also going to totally ignore, but they do uh, exist. So a total of six kingdoms. All right, so in the animal kingdom, 
All members have a couple of common characteristics. They are multicellular, sexual reproducing, and for the most part, heterotrophs. Okay, so um, again, there are a whole lot of phyla splitting off of this animal kingdom. We are going to look at seven of them. All right, the first one uh, is called Nidaria. There's a silent C there for what reasons I can't tell you. Uh, and these are things like jellyfish and sea anemones, and they have stinging cells. They also, and I want you to add this to your notes, it's something called, for the most part, they have radial symmetry. Okay, meaning that they radiate their symmetry in all directions, okay? So not the same in two halves, but in all directions. All right, the next one is something called platyhelminthes. Well, who came up with that? I can't tell you. Let's find them and complain. Okay, platyhelminthes are flatworms, okay? Like this ribbon worm or like this tapeworm, okay? So they have one opening into the gut. So what does that mean? Well, the in-hole is also the out-hole. Things go in, okay? It gets digested, and then it comes back out through the same hole. So it doesn't have uh, an in and an out thing. They are sh uh, flatly shaped. They have no lungs, okay? And since they have no lungs, they rely on diffusion to get um, things like oxygen in and out, which again is why they're flat, to increase the surface area um, for things like being able to absorb oxygen through their skin. And they are not divided into sections. They are what we call unsegmented. Okay, so they're kind of one blobby flat thing. Okay, they aren't chopped up into things like a head or an abdomen or anything like that. And that's going to be quite a bit different um, for something uh, like the earthworm, which is a member of the annelid phyla. So these are our segmented worms. So you can clearly see how this is uh, chopped up into different segments. And this is uh, one of the first phyla from an evolutionary perspective that we see a one-way digestive tract, okay? And that's something that we call a true gut, okay? Meaning that things go in one hole, they're digested as they go throughout the animal, and they go out a different hole than they came in. You're also going to notice, as with the platyhelminthes, the flatworms, they have uh, something called bilateral symmetry, Okay, and bilateral symmetry means I can cut it in half and it's the same on each half. So not round like radial symmetry like with the Nadarians, but bilateral, bilateral symmetry. All of the animal phyla that we're going to talk about, except for the Nadarians, they all have bilateral symmetry. And that's also true of one of my favorite phyla, the mollusks. And the mollusks are an incredibly diverse phyla um, because they contain things like snails, bivalves like clams, or an octopus, an octopus who's eating a scallop it looks like. Okay, so those all look like very different organisms and they have very different lifestyles, but they are all mollusks. Okay, so they are aquatic. Most of them produce shells like this snail or this clam, not all of them, like the octopus, obviously. They have a one-way digestive tract, again, also known as a true gut, and they are not segmented, okay? So they are kind of blobby. Sometimes with something like an octopus, we refer to like the head and the feet, but it's not a true segmentation. Okay, our next phyla, the arthropods, win the award for most numerous animal on the planet. There are more arthropods than any other phyla, and that's because this includes all of the insects, spiders, and crustaceans. So arthro literally means joint, okay? And pod means foot. So these are all things that have jointed feet. They have bendy feet, 
okay? They also have a segmented body, so you're gonna notice things like a head, an abdomen, a thorax. They have exoskeletons, so they wear their skeleton on the outside, okay, kind of like a shell. And again, they have jointed limbs. They also have bilateral symmetry, but I'm not gonna make a note on that for all of them. You can tell how if you cut it in half, it would be the same on one side as the other. But if you feel the need to keep writing bilateral symmetry, you just go right ahead and do that. Okay, next up are our sponges. So if you've ever been scuba diving or you've been to like the natural selection of Bed Bath & Beyond, okay, you've probably noticed these guys. And these are actually animals. So they are multicellular um, sexually reproducing heterotrophs, and they belong to the phyla called periphera. Okay, this comes from pore. So they are filter feeders. Um, they literally don't have a digestive tract. What happens is water will go in, and then it will come out um, through tiny little holes or pores, but the food particles, like the plankton that's in the water, will get stuck in here, and that's what these guys eat, okay? So they are filter feeders. They have no digestive tract. They are sessile or stuck to the bottom, and they have no discernible uh, organs or bones or tissues. And finally, we have the chordates, okay? Chordates are things like fish or humans. They have a notochord, which is kind of like a spinal cord, and most of them have a backbone or a vertebral column that goes around those things. So we often just call these the vertebrates, okay? But you need to know them as chordata. So if you are kind of wondering why aren't humans classified as arthropods, we have bendy legs, jointed legs, okay? But that is a separate phyla, okay? All arthropods are invertebrates. The only phyla that includes vertebrates are the ones that uh, belong to chordata. So chordata is the only phyla for vertebrates. You can't put them into uh, other phyla. Okay, so in our taxonomy, we go... Well, domain first, I guess, and then kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Okay, and I want to talk about the five classes of vertebrates or chordates. So we know we're in the domain eukarya. In the animal kingdom, we are in the chordata uh, phylum, and now we're about to enter into classes. So smaller and smaller, smaller groups each time. So all of these are going to be types of that one phyla called chordates. Okay, so all of these classes um, are going to have vertebral columns or backbones. And the first one we're going to get started with here are fish. Okay, fish are aquatic. Hello. Okay, they use gills to absorb oxygen from their environment. And they have skulls that are either made of bone or cartilage. So um, sharks have a cartilaginous skeleton, okay, but they do have a skull. This crazy huge mutant goldfish has a bony skull, but they have skulls. Most have jaws and teeth, and they have fins, but they don't have finger bones in there. So they don't have that pentadactyl limb that we've learned about before. Um, this is literally just kind of cartilage with skin webbed around it. So no finger bones, no pentadactyl limb. Now, all of the other classes of vertebrates we're going to talk about do have the pentadactyl limb, and I'm not going to list that on all of them. We just need to know that this is the only class that we're going to discuss that doesn't have that feature. All right, so next up are these disgusting creatures called the amphibians. And this word ampha means both. And we've talked about this with amphipathic proteins that have both polar edges and nonpolar sections. Okay, so these on the outside would be polar. They're hanging out with these polar or hydrophilic heads. 
And these sections on the inside would be nonpolar because they're hanging out with the hydrophobic tails. But I've digressed. Ampha means both. So amphibians um, have part of their life um, in the water and part of their life on land. And so that's really where they're getting this word from. So their larval form is always aquatic, like tadpoles, and they always have gills where the adult um, breathes with lungs, okay? Most of them have four legs. Uh, their eggs lack a membrane around the embryo. We'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. And they are ectothermic or cold-blooded. So these are our frogs and our salamanders. All right, and when we get into our reptiles, we're going to see um, this membrane around the embryo in what we call an amniote egg. And you may remember that as like the amniotic fluid. Okay, so the amnion is right here. And that's kind of like a protective uh, layer for that embryo. Reptiles are also ectothermic or cold-blooded and they have scales. So these are our uh, snakes and turtles and alligators and lizards and all those fun things. Okay, birds also have amniot eggs. Okay, their eggs have hard shells. You're gonna notice that reptiles, a lot of them will have a softer type shell. Most of them are bipedal, bi meaning two, so they walk on not one but two legs. Um, and that's because their other two limbs have evolved into wings. They have hollow bones, which makes them lighter for flight. They have a beak with no teeth. They generally have a really fast heart rate and a fast metabolism, so they kind of have to eat a lot. Um, so you know examples of birds, you can list whatever you want. Okay, flamingos, hummingbirds, there's a whole lot of them. And then finally we have the mammals. So mammals also have amniot eggs, but there's no shell around our eggs. Um, they have hair or fur, which we haven't seen in any of the other classes. And we get the name mammals from the fact that they have mammary glands to produce milk uh, for nursing their young. All mammals have mammary glands to produce milk for their young. They are endothermic or warm-blooded, so they are using their metabolism to um, control their body heat so they can choose to speed up cell respiration to increase their body temperature or decrease cell respiration to cool it down. And most have four legs or limbs. Obviously, uh, humans don't have four legs, but we have four limbs. And so these are things like a rabbit or a hippo or a person, okay? All the mammals. All right, one of the last things that you need to know um, from this chapter is how to use something called a dichotomous key. So di means two or to split. So if you diverge and your group is going this way and half the people go this way and half the people go this way, you have diverged. It's kind of what a dichotomous key does. So when we're using a dichotomous key, you're always going to know that they are kind of like yes or no questions. Like there's no gray area that whatever you're asking can fit into one of two categories. So let's use um, this key to classify these leaves. Okay, so leaf A, we're gonna start up top. Needle leaves or non-needle leaves? Well, these are non-needle leaves. Okay, there's no leaves here or needles. Okay, so it tells us to go to step three. Okay, so I'm gonna skip step two then. All right, in step three it says, are they a simple leaf or are they compound leaves made of many leaflets? Well, this is just one simple leaf. So it says go to step four. Okay, step four asks, is it a smooth edge or a jagged edge? Well, this is a smooth edge. Okay, so that's saying go to step five. All right, so is the leaf edge smooth or lobed? Okay, so it's just smooth. So that says, ah, oh, this must be a magnolia would help if I could spell that, magnolia. 
Okay, so your job is to use your key to go ahead and classify all of the other leaves. Okay, now in addition to using them, you also know how have to know how to make them. Okay, so let's say I wanted to classify these four organisms using um, a dichotomous key. So remember, um, I would have something like step one, okay, and I might start with legs or no legs. Okay, if it has legs, I might say go to step number two. Okay, and if it has no legs, there's only one organism with no legs, so I would write the scientific name here. Okay, so you want to keep doing that until you have a working key. Um, I recommend that you um, try to use or let someone else uh, pick something at random and then use your key to identify it to see if it works. And that'll do it for chapter 5.3 on classification of biodiversity.